At 5 a.m. on September 30th, 2008, a 61 year old man named Xian Tia Xiong finished getting dressed inside of the bedroom that he shared with his wife in the city of Beijing, China. After he finished getting dressed, Xian reached down and scooped up his backpack off the floor that was already packed, and then as quietly as he could, he kind of tiptoed around the bed to his wife's side to give her a kiss goodbye. Xian was going to be heading out to a local mountain that day for a day hike. And so Xian, he gets next to his wife and he bends down to kiss her, and right as he does that, he accidentally wakes her up. And so his wife opens her eyes and she looks up at him, and Xian just says, you know, I love you. He gives her a kiss, and he tells her, hey, I'll be back tonight before midnight. And so his wife, she kind of groggily said, okay, and she grabbed his hand and squeezed it. And she told him that she loved him. And then she fell back asleep. And moments later, Xian had left the bedroom and walked out the front door. Xian's home was only a couple of blocks away from the train station. And since he needed to ride a train and then also a bus to get to this local mountain that was about an hour and a half journey away, the train station was his first stop. And so Xian, as he walked towards the station, he was all smiles. I mean, he was really excited about this day. So Zhen was retired, but he had spent his whole life teaching geography at Beijing Number no. 5 Middle School. And he was a very passionate teacher, but the thing he was most passionate about that he routinely really pushed on his students, in some ways more than geography, was his love of nature. In fact, Xian loved nature so much that when he was not teaching, he basically spent all of his off time out in nature going for hikes. I mean, that was his thing. And today, Xian was especially excited about his hike because he was hiking one of his favorite trails. It was located on Mount Miaofeng, which is a mountain located 30 miles to the northwest of where Xian lived. And this mountain was quite famous because of all the sacred and ancient temples that kind of dotted the mountain all over the place. And then also there were all these beautiful roses, like the flower that would bloom all over the mountain in the summer. And so it's just this totally strikingly beautiful place. And normally, Jian would actually hike up this trail and then actually camp out on Mount Miaofeng, mostly because on the summit, there was this incredible view of downtown Beijing. And at night, the view is like spectacular with the city all lit up. But on this particular day, Jian knew an overnight stay was not possible because he had to be back home by the next day because it was his mother's 90th birthday. And he was very close with his mother and he was not gonna miss that. And so Jean eventually made it to the train station. He bought his ticket, he boarded his train, and then he sat down in a seat. And as soon as he did, he opened up his bag and pulled out a stack of papers. For this hike, Jean had packed himself some food and water inside of his backpack. He also packed a newspaper called the Beijing Youth Daily, and he brought along his diary. But his diary was a little bit unique. Zhen, because he loved nature so much and didn't like the idea of wasting anything, what he would do when he was a teacher at Beijing Number no. 5 Middle School, he would just take scrap paper and start writing on that. And he would compile all his scrap paper into these sort of diaries that he would keep. And so the reason he did that was primarily because he was so in love with nature, he hated the idea of wasting anything. And so Jian passed the time on the train by writing in his diary, AKA his stack of scrap paper, and also reading this newspaper. And Jian knew he really needed to read the entire newspaper pretty quickly, because by the time he got to the mountain, he was gonna do what he always did, which is he would bring a newspaper with him on a hike, and as he walked, he would take out a page periodically and tie it to a tree, kind of marking his way. That way, when he turned around and came back down, he would have his path marked because Jian did not always walk on a clearly marked trail, and so this was his way of not getting lost. And so Jian would ride the train car, and then he would get off and he would board a bus, and then finally, right around 7 a.m., that bus would come to a stop in the tiny village of Chenfang, which is located right at the base of Mount Miaofeng. And so Jian grabbed his backpack, he hopped off the bus, and then began walking through the village towards the mountain. And then by about 7.20 a.m., so not long after Jian had left the bus, he was almost up to Mount Miaofeng when he pulled out his cell phone and he called his cousin. It was a brief conversation, and all Jian really wanted to do was just to make sure his cousin was going to be around the next day for Jian's mother's birthday. And the cousin said he would, and so Jian told him, okay, I'm going hiking today, and I will see you tomorrow. And then he hung up. And then, only a couple minutes later, Xian disappeared into the beautiful forests of Mount Miaofeng.
A few years ago, I started noticing that I was getting a whole bunch of solicitation phone calls and emails. Now, at first, it was just some random company trying to sell me some product, but pretty quickly, it took a turn and became just a succession of spammers and scammers trying to get me to wire them money or send them a gift card or click on suspicious links. Now, honestly, this was more of a nuisance than a real concern because I didn't read any of these emails. I just kind of ignored them, but it made me wonder how do they have my information? So as an experiment, I just Googled myself and I can tell you I was genuinely shocked by how much of my personal information was just out there for anyone to access. And keep in mind, this happened pre Mr. Ballin. This is like, I have no social media. I don't post anything to the internet, yet somehow my data was widely available on the internet. I wound up hiring a service that basically scrubbed the internet and removed all of that private information. And as soon as they were done, these spammy phone calls and emails stopped. And most importantly, I had peace of mind again that my identity was secure. So if this could happen to me, it definitely could happen to you if it hasn't already. And so this is why today's video sponsor is Aura. Aura is the one-stop shop for securing your identity. Aura can identify all those data brokers who are selling your information without your consent. And what they can do is they can put in an opt-out request on your behalf and take down your personal information off of those shady websites. Aura offers many other features as well that will also help protect you and your family's privacy. They have a VPN, they have identity and credit monitoring, they have antivirus, password management, they have identity theft insurance, they have parental controls, and much, much more, all on a single app. Aura is very easy to set up and you get everything at one affordable price. I value my privacy and I value yours too. So right now, go to Aura.com slash Mr. Ballin to start your two week free trial now. The link is also down in the description below. Again, that's Aura.com slash Mr. Ballin to start your two week free trial today. So Jian's wife did not expect to hear from Jian at any point that day because she knew he would have terrible cell phone service up on the mountain. But she did expect her husband to be home on time. He had told her that morning before he left that he would be home that night before midnight. And if you knew Jian, you knew this guy was never late. He said, I'm gonna be someplace at a certain time, he would be there. So when 10 p.m. rolled around that night and still Jian was not back yet and he had not called, Jian's wife was actually not worried because she was thinking, okay, well, it's 10. He'll be home in the next couple of hours because he said he'd be here by midnight tonight and he will be here tonight. And so she went to bed expecting to wake up and see Jian in bed with her in the morning. But the next morning when she woke up, Jian was not in bed, so he did not come home. And so his wife immediately was very concerned and began calling Jian's family and nobody knew where he was. And so that day the family went to the police and they reported Jian missing. The local police immediately organized a search for Jian. However, they knew this was gonna be a very challenging search. Mount Miafeng is not some enormous mountain by any means. It's a decent sized mountain, but you know, it's really known for having these paths that twist and turn all over the place. So it's pretty easy to get lost. And then also there's a whole bunch of sheer cliff faces kind of all over the place. So if you're not paying attention, you could literally just walk off a ledge. So in short, this is a dangerous and confusing place. And at the same time that the search was happening out on the mountain, the police were also in contact with Jian's cell phone service provider to see if they could track down Jian's cell phone because obviously if they could find that, they might find Jian too. But the only way a cell phone can be tracked is if the cell phone is on, because when it's on, it connects to the nearest cell phone tower, and that's how these service providers are able to tell where these phones are. They look to see which tower it's connected to. But when Jian's cell phone service provider looked for his phone, they quickly determined his phone was off. So unless the phone came back on again, they would not be able to locate the phone. However, they were able to pull all of Jian's cell phone signal history up until his phone was turned off. And what they found in the signal history is the day before, so the day Jian went missing, his cell phone was on at 4 p.m. that evening and he received a phone call at 4 p.m. And the service provider was able to see that when this phone call came in, Jian's cell phone was not where they thought it would be. It was not high up Mount Miafeng. It actually was near the base of the mountain. And when police reached out to the person who had called Jian at 4 p.m., 
they discovered it was just a friend of Xi'an's, and this friend said that Xi'an said he was coming down the mountain now and he'd be home soon. So this new information did basically line up with what Xi'an had told his family he'd be doing that day, you know, just a quick day hike. Although again, they kind of expected it to be a little bit longer. It seemed a little odd he'd be down the mountain by 4 p.m., but still, this basically lined up with what they thought he was doing. However, this new information did not help explain what happened to Xi'an. Like, why was he missing? The expectation was he must have gotten lost or hurt or something up on this mountain. You know, maybe he's stranded somewhere and can't go anywhere. But now, based on this phone call, it sounded an awful lot like Jian was not even on the mountain when he disappeared. So where was he? Police had already checked all the bus stations and train stations in the area, you know, to see if maybe Jian took a different way home or something. But when they went to all these different stations, there was no evidence that Jian had been to any of them. And there was another problem. Members of Jian's family told the police about Jian's habit of tying newspapers to trees to mark his trail as he hiked. And the family told the police that Jian did this every single time he hiked. And his wife told the police that for sure she knew her husband had brought along a copy of that newspaper. So by all expectations, there should be markers up on that mountain literally leading searchers to wherever Jian went. But after an entire day of searching Mount Miaofeng, they didn't find a single newspaper anywhere. For the next several days, this big search for Jian continued, but nothing was found. That is, until October 7th, so one week after Jian had vanished. On that day, Jian's cell phone service provider noticed that Jian's cell phone had suddenly turned back on. And the phone was not on or near Mount Miaofeng, Instead, it was located 36 miles away from the mountain at a train station called Beijing West Railway Station. Now, the cell phone was only on for a couple of seconds, but it was on long enough for the provider to confirm that it really was in that location. And so the police immediately dispatched a team to go to Beijing West Railway Station and see if they could find Jian. But when they got there, Jian was not there. His phone was not there. You know, they looked at all the security footage. There was no sign of Jian. They searched the surrounding areas. Nothing. And on this day, at basically the same time that police are at this railway station trying to make sense of, you know, what's going on with the cell phone, a villager from Chanfang Village, which is that little village that sits at the base of Mount Miaofeng, came forward with a very strange story. He said on the day that Jian disappeared, this villager was at his little shop. He sold walnuts to hikers that were making their way towards Mount Miaofeng. It was basically like snacks for the hike. And he sees this guy walking up through the village towards the mountain, and he looked exactly like Jian, because now Jian's face was on the news, and this villager had seen it, and so he felt like he had seen Jian. And so this villager said, you know, this guy who looked exactly like Jian, he walked up and actually stopped at this villager's shop to buy some walnuts. And this villager and this man who looked like Jian, they just chatted for a few minutes. And at some point, this guy, this guy who looked like Jian, asked the villager, you know, hey, these are great, but where else can I buy walnuts? I want to buy other types of walnuts and bring them back to my family. And so this villager was like, oh yeah, well, the best walnuts in all of Beijing are actually located about 30 miles away at the base of another mountain. It's called Tiatua Mountain, and there are vendors over there who sell the best walnuts. So that's your answer right over there. And then after the villager said this, this guy who looked just like Jian, it's like everything changed for him. It's like his expression changed, his tone changed. It's like he's been given this information that's changed his life, you know, about these walnuts. And he says to the villager, okay, I'm gonna go there right now. And without saying anything else, this man just turned and began quickly walking away from the walnuts, back through town, back towards the bus stop. So away from Mount Miaofeng. In theory, this guy is going to the bus to what? Commute 30 miles to this other mountain, Tiatua Mountain, to get these walnuts? I mean, the villager does not know this guy, but even he felt like this is bizarre. This guy comes up, he's buying snacks to go hike Mount Miaofeng. He seems really excited about it and I offhandedly mention these walnuts, and he's like, boom, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go 30 miles to this other mountain to get these walnuts. It just seemed weird. And then when police spoke to Jian's family about this new information, 
they would learn that Jean did not have a special interest in walnuts, and neither did his family. And even if there was a reason why Jean just really wanted these walnuts, he would not have had time in that day to take the bus 30 miles to Tiatois Mountain, get these walnuts, go 30 miles back, and hike up Mount Miaofeng because he can't stay the night. He needs to come back tonight in order to go to his mother's birthday party the next day. So it just made no sense. But this walnut thing was basically the only lead police really had because everything else was a dead end. And so they decided to shift their search area from Mount Miaofeng to Tiatua Mountain. And pretty much right away, they saw something that gave them hope that Jian could be here. They found pages from the Beijing Youth Daily newspaper tied to trees on the mountain. And when they looked more closely at the newspapers, they found the publication date of this newspaper lined up with the copy that Jian would have had with him on the day he vanished. And so, of course, the searchers just began following this trail of newspapers, hoping Jian would be at the other end. For two days, searchers very diligently followed this trail up the mountain. It kind of wound around and they went pretty slowly because as they're moving, you know, they're constantly checking everything around. They don't want to miss any clues. But finally, after two days of following this trail, they eventually found something. The newspapers led them to a campsite. Now, the campsite was abandoned, but there was a bed of hay, there were some used water bottles and some toilet paper. And so just from the looks of it, this campsite looked relatively active, like somebody had been staying here recently for at least a day or two. And so it seemed pretty likely, based on everything else, that this was Jian's campsite. And pretty quickly, after searching the campsite, they found something that virtually guaranteed that this was his campsite. Authorities found this plastic bag that was sitting next to the bed, and inside of the bag was a piece of scrap paper from Beijing Number no. 5 Middle School. And on this scrap paper was a note. And the note said, Jian had indeed hiked up Tiatuan Mountain on September 30th. This would have been the day that he left, so the day he disappeared. And then on his way down, he said he got lost and was forced to spend the night out here. And so that explained the campsite. And then on October 1st, so that would have been the day after he spent the night out here, he said he was going to attempt to follow the ridge line down the mountain to a nearby village to safety. And this note ended with the phrase, leaving this note here just in case, love to everyone who passes by. Now, at first glance, this note was like amazing news because suddenly it seemed totally possible that Jian was just fine. I mean, the way the note was written, it sounded like he was at least healthy and safe, Albeit, I'm sure he was not happy to be stuck up on a mountain, but, you know, he loved being in nature, and so he seemed okay. And then he had a reasonable plan for how he was going to get out of there, you know, follow the ridge line, go down to a village, go to safety. But as the police analyzed this note, they noticed that some things were off about it. First of all, this note basically directly contradicts other facts of this case. Remember, cell phone records prove Jian got a phone call at 4 p.m. on the day he went missing from his friend, and his friend would report that Jian told him that he was coming down Mount Miaofeng and he'd be home soon. But according to the note they found, that was not possible because the note said Jian at 4 p.m. on September 30th, the day he went missing, he would have been on Tiatua Mountain, either hiking up or being in the process of getting lost and, you know, ultimately making that campsite where he camped out for at least one night. And so in addition to this factual discrepancy with this note, another issue with the note was just the way it was written. Now, Jian's wife had a chance to look at the note and she would say, that is my husband's handwriting. But the note contained a bunch of very strange language choices that just didn't make sense for Jian to be using. For example, this note, which really should have been a first person point of view, you know, Jian has gotten lost, he's by himself, he's writing to the world, kind of letting somebody know what's going on with him. And so it really should have been written in the first person. My name is Jian, I am lost, here's what I'm doing. But the note was written in the third person. Jian got lost on the mountain, and so he is going to camp out for the night, and tomorrow he's going to make his way out to safety. But despite being written in the third person, it did sound like somebody was talking about themselves. It did not feel like somebody else was attempting to document what Jian was doing. 
But by far the weirdest part of this note was the tone shift that happened about halfway through. So the first half of this letter was written, albeit in the third person, but it was grammatically correct and sort of formal, like you would expect from a very well-educated retired teacher. But once you get to that second half of the note, the grammar started being really awkward. And then the very final line, which says, love to everyone who passes by, that actually sounds totally awkward in Chinese. So love to everyone who passes by is the translation into English. And that basically makes sense to us. Like that's not an awkward phrase, but if you put it back in Chinese, it's so awkward. It would be like if I tried to say to you, I take the bus to work, but instead I said to work, take bus, right? Like I wouldn't say it that way. And it would immediately seem very awkward for anybody who knows me if I wrote or said something like that. And so this last line stood out so much that actually police and friends and family of Xi'an assumed he must have left that in there as like a secret message or a code, like a distress signal, especially when you consider the other weird factors around this note. But nobody could figure out what it meant. The day after this note was discovered, a searcher was up in the vicinity of Xi'an's campsite on Tiatua Mountain, and they were walking around, kind of retracing their footsteps, looking for new places to search. When they turned a corner and up ahead, they noticed there was this tree kind of hanging out over this rocky cliff and dangling from the tree was something gray that looked sort of out of place. And so the searcher, you know, sensing this could be a clue of Xi'an's whereabouts, he yelled out for other searchers in the area that he had found something, and then he took off running towards this thing to see what it was. And when he got up to the tree, he looked up, and he saw it was a pair of sweatpants that had clearly been intentionally tied to this branch in the tree. And so the searcher, he reached up and grabbed one of the pant legs and kind of tugged on it. And when he did, all these white things began falling out of the pants and landing on the ground. And when the searcher stopped and looked down to see what they were, he couldn't believe it. It was a whole pile of human bones. However, they were not Jiens. In fact, nobody ever figured out who these bones belonged to or why they were stuffed inside of pants and tied to a tree on this mountain. But the discovery of these bones would open up a whole new mystery because after these bones were found, all the searchers came over and basically just began combing the area near these bones and the police began uncovering body after body after body. They found two more sets of human bones stuffed into pants and tied to trees. And they found the other bodies at the foot of a cliff and also inside of this well and inside of this cave. And so in total, authorities found 10 sets of human remains in the vicinity near Xi'an's campsite, but none of the human remains belong to Xi'an. Officials were only able to identify a few of the bodies and they were not able to figure out how they died or whether or not foul play was involved. But the discovery of those bodies did mean one thing for Jian's case. It meant, you know, all these people had previously gone up Tiatua Mountain before Jian went up and vanished. And when these other people went up the mountain, clearly something horrible happened to them and we don't know what it is. Is there a killer on the loose? Is there some animal or creature out there that's taken people out? I mean, we don't know. But what started to happen since Xian went missing and his story was all over the news in China is that all these other hikers who've been on Tiatua Mountain before have begun sharing their experiences when they hiked up Tiatua Mountain and some of their stories about what they've seen on that mountain are horrifying. One person said they were walking up the mountain. They had their partner with them who was a little bit farther back the trail. And so they're kind of walking up on their own. And the first person, as they're walking up the trail, suddenly sees this guy just kind of come out of nowhere wielding an ax. And he walks up to this person and all he says is, are you alone? And the hiker's like, no, my partner's back there. They're coming up here. What's going on? But the ax man, he basically acted like he didn't even hear their answer. And he just asked it again, are you alone? And the hiker was like, no, my, my partner's back there. And the ax man again just said, are you alone? Are you alone? Are you alone? 
And this axe person kept doing that until the hiker and their partner just turned and ran. And then another hiker shared a story about how they were walking up a trail on Tiatua Mountain, and at some point they lifted their head up, and he saw a little ways up the trail, kind of off the trail, so in the tree line, were all these people, like this group of strangers, just standing there motionless, kind of half behind trees, like they were kind of trying to hide themselves, but also not. And they were just staring at this hiker, unmoving, not speaking, just staring. And so the hiker, you know, they look up and they see this and they were so unnerved so quickly that they just turned and left and they have no idea who those people were. And so obviously we have no way of verifying these other hikers' stories about what they saw on Tiatua Mountain. But when you combine their testimony with Jian's story, it really makes you wonder what's going on up there. The official search for Xi'an was called off at the end of October, so roughly one month after he vanished. But unofficially, the search for Xi'an continues to this day. However, they still have not found his body and basically no real progress has been made. At around 1 a.m. on August 27, 2000, a fisherman named Sam Watts did his best to keep his balance on the wet deck of the huge commercial fishing boat that he was working on. And as he tried to do that, he looked over at his crewmate, Michael Edwards, another fisherman, who was grabbing onto the mast as the ship rocked underneath their feet. Sam and Michael and the four other crew members on board this boat had just dropped their anchor 56 miles off the northeast coast of Queensland, Australia, and up until about an hour earlier, the sea had been very calm. But now, you know, this huge storm had rolled in, the wind had picked up, the waves were huge, and while the four other crew members had already gone below to try to catch some sleep, Sam and Michael were now on the deck, doing their best to try to secure everything before they went down below. And so as the wind is whipping and the waves are smashing against the side of this boat, Sam and Michael decide they should split up to work more efficiently, where Sam will go to the front of the boat and Michael will go to the back of the boat, and they would each kind of work towards the middle of the boat, checking all the fastenings and the knots to make sure everything was good, and then when they reached the center, they would be good and they could go down below. And so they did that, Sam went to the front, Michael to the back, and as they began to work, they kept constant eye contact with each other because this was obviously a very dangerous thing they were doing. But at some point, as Sam was making his way, he had to duck down to check a particular fastening. And so when he ducked down, he lost sight of Michael just for a second. But in that split second, this huge rogue wave smashed the side of the boat, practically capsizing it, sending Sam flying towards the railing. But Sam luckily grabbed onto the railing before being thrown into the water. And then as the boat kind of began to rock back to level, Sam instinctively looked back down the ship to look for Michael. And he watched through the darkness and the rain as Michael went careening off the side into the ocean. He hadn't been able to grab onto anything. And so the instant the boat kind of leveled out again, Sam screamed for Michael, but he couldn't see him. And so he ran down below, woke up the whole crew. And so moments later, the crew was on the deck. They had their big spotlights out, scanning the water you know, through this big storm, looking for signs of Michael. And at the same time, the captain had come up and he was on the radio talking to police. And so several minutes later, a police boat managed to come out to the fishing boat. And at the same time, you know, the crew is still desperately looking for Michael. They haven't found him yet. And now the police began circling around the whole area, calling out for Michael, throwing out buoys into the water in hopes of, you know, maybe Michael sees one and grabs hold. But nobody could find Michael. He was just gone. And so all that morning into the early afternoon, the police continued to look in the area for Michael. You know, the crew on board the fishing boat did the same thing, but still nobody could find a trace of Michael. And so around noon that day, the search was called off and the police told Sam and the rest of the crew of this fishing boat that unfortunately, you know, at this point, it seemed very likely that Michael had drowned. And so, of course, Sam and the rest of the crew were basically in shock. I mean, this happened so quickly. How could it be that, you know, Michael just a few hours ago was joking around with them, part of the crew, and now he's dead? I mean, it was just unbelievable. But now, unfortunately, Sam and the rest of the crew had to basically put their grief aside and make a very practical, albeit very cold, decision, which was, you know, even though Michael's dead, do we stay out here and continue fishing? Or because of his death, do we just go back home? And you might think that decision was actually super easy to make, that of course, you know, they would pack it in and go back home. How could you possibly stay out here and go fishing considering what had happened? 
but you need to understand it cost a lot of money to go out on these fishing excursions and they had just left and so they had not caught anything. So they had spent all this money and they had no return from it. And these fishermen were not wealthy. In fact, honestly, they needed the money from this trip just to provide for their families. And so if they did turn around right now, I mean, it would really hurt all of them. And it would also make it really hard to get the funding again to go out later. And so after some pretty awkward deliberation, the crew decided that, you know what, we got to stay out here and fish. But the silver lining was, hey, you know, if we stay out here for another day or so, you know, maybe Michael's body will float to the surface and we can at least recover him and bring him back home to his family. And so all day that day, the fishermen stayed out and fished and they were very successful. I mean, one after another, they were catching these cod that were six feet long and nearly a hundred pounds. They're called flowery cods. But despite how incredible this was for their business, you know, this was not a cause for celebration because they had just lost their friend the day before. And so it was a very somber day and all day, you know, all the fishermen really are looking out at the water, hoping to see Michael's body. But, you know, by the end of that 24 hours of fishing, they didn't see any sign of Michael. And so they packed everything in and they headed back to port. They sold off all of their cod that they had bought. And then each of the fishermen went back to their families and grieved the loss of their friend. A few days later, a factory worker was standing in front of a fish processing line with this huge 97 pound cod right in front of them. This is one of the flowery cods that Sam and the other fishermen had caught 24 hours after their friend had gone overboard. And so this worker took their knife and like they did every day all day long, began opening up this fish. And at some point after cutting it open and looking inside of this enormous cod, the worker just stopped and couldn't believe what they were seeing. And then they began to scream. It would turn out a few days earlier after Michael had been thrown overboard during that storm, he very likely had been alive when he hit the water. But the area where they were fishing off the coast of Queensland, Australia, was known for having lots of sharks and saltwater crocodiles in the area. And so pretty much immediately, Michael was attacked by either a shark or a crocodile or maybe both. And during this feeding frenzy, as Michael's getting ripped to pieces, his head got ripped off and began to float away. And at some point, one of those huge flowery cods saw the head and ate it whole. And then later that day, Michael's colleagues caught the cod who caught Michael's head. And so that factory worker who opened up that particular cod saw Michael's undigested head looking up at her and apparently his face was fixed in terror with his eyes wide and his mouth open as if his final moment had been him screaming. On the afternoon of July 13th, 1994, A man woke up feeling very confused and disoriented and he felt some pain in the back of his head. And as he opened his eyes, he kind of slowly realized that he was on his back in a ditch on the side of the road, looking up at a big blue sky. The man tried to sit up, but as soon as he did, he felt this throbbing pain in the back of his head and he reached back to touch it. But the second he did, you know, it hurt even worse. And he definitely felt there was a pretty big lump on the back of his head. And then when he brought his hands in front of his face, he saw he had all these bruises around his wrists that he had no idea what they were from. And so as this man in the ditch is trying to figure out what's going on, suddenly this older man who he didn't know just appeared by the side of the road and looked down and said, hey, are are you okay? And so the guy in the ditch is looking at this guy. He's got no idea who he is. And he wants to say, like, what's going on? Where am I? Who am I? What's happening? But he couldn't find the words. It's like he just kept looking at this older guy, looking at his wrist and feeling his head and having no idea what's going on. But then for some reason, three names popped into this guy's head, the guy in the ditch. He thought of three names. He had no idea whose names these were, but for some reason he felt like those names were really important. And so after a few minutes of awkward silence, as the guy in the ditch is trying to talk, he finally just blurts out these three names. He says, uh, Pat, Joel, Chris. And so the older man who had asked the guy in the ditch what was going on, He didn't really know how to react to this guy blurting out these names. And so he kind of ignored it and just said, okay, uh, hi, my name's Steve. And then Steve, the older man, helped the guy from the ditch out of the ditch. And then once the man in the ditch was on his feet, kind of looking around, he looked at Steve and suddenly he could say other words. And he said to Steve, where are we? And Steve looked at him and said, we're in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Now, the guy in the ditch didn't know why, but he immediately felt like Wyoming had to be wrong. Like there's no way he could be in Wyoming, but the guy in the ditch didn't know where he was supposed to be. He didn't know who Steve was. He didn't know who Pat, Joel, or Chris was. And so it's all totally confusing. And so he just stood there kind of saying nothing. And as he did, Steve said, hold on a minute, I'm gonna get my stuff. 
And so Steve kind of shuffled down the road like 10, 20 feet away where there was a shopping cart full of cans and there was a backpack and some other things dangling off the side. And as Steve grabbed the shopping cart, turned it around and slowly began pushing it back towards the guy in the ditch, the guy in the ditch stared at Steve and kind of put together that, you know, Steve must be homeless. And this realization made the guy in the ditch think that, you know, maybe he was homeless too. And so suddenly, instinctively, the guy from the ditch began reaching into his pockets, thinking maybe he had an idea or something that would show him who he was, that would show he was not homeless, that he had a place that he needed to go to. And he reached in his pockets, but there was nothing. All he found was 23 cents and a comb. And so by the time Steve came over with his cart and asked the guy from the ditch, hey, do you want to come to the shelter with me? The guy from the ditch was like, okay, yeah, I'll go with you. And then once the guy from the ditch and Steve arrived at the shelter, when they went inside, you know, the guy from the ditch had to introduce himself to the people who ran the shelter. And so he made up a name combining one of those names that was running through his head, Pat, with the color of the desk of the person who was asking him for his name inside of the shelter. And so he just called himself Pat Brown. And after Pat Brown got a room inside of the shelter, he went to bed that night still having no idea what was going on, but he felt confident, you know, if I just sleep tonight, I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll know what's going on. I'll figure out, you know, what happened to me. But the next day when Pat woke up, he was still completely confused, did not know who he was, had no idea what was going on, but he had the wherewithal to know that, you know, something bad must have happened to him and maybe he should go talk to the police because maybe they would know if other people were looking for him or something. And so Pat walked from the shelter to the police station. It was not far away. And he went inside and very politely, he walked up to the desk. He introduced himself to the cop who was on duty. And Pat just began explaining to the cop as much as he could remember. He said, you know, yesterday I woke up in a ditch. I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm here. I think I have amnesia. I just keep thinking of three names in my head, Pat, Joel, and Chris, but I have no idea what they mean. Can you help me? Now, the cop who's hearing this did not think, oh my goodness, this is totally legitimate. Let's launch an investigation to figure out who you are. Instead, the cop is like, is this guy on drugs? Is he mentally ill? You know, what's going on with this guy? But the cop would say, you know, Pat was incredibly polite and did not appear to be intoxicated. And so the cop humored him and said, okay, you know what? Let's look through the most recent missing person reports in the area to see if somebody matching your description, you know, is a missing person. And so the cop began going through the database, but he couldn't find anybody that matched Pat's description. And so at some point he said, look, like I can't really help you very much here because you're a grown man. You do not seem to be in distress here. And even though it's very unfortunate that you can't remember who you are or where you need to go or you know where your family is, that's not really a police matter. But as he was saying this to Pat, Pat, who's kind of crestfallen, you know, he's putting his hands near his face and just kind of reacting to this news that the police are not gonna help him. And the police officer says, hold on a minute, look at your hand. And so Pat looked at his hand and he saw, you know, there was no ring on his left ring finger, but there was a pretty obvious callus where a ring should have been. It looked like, you know, Pat must have been wearing a ring up until recently, and for some reason it was now off. And so the cop said, hey, it looks like you may be married or were married for a long time because he got that callus. But, you know, beyond that, I'm sorry, there's not much else I can offer you. And so even though this was somewhat valuable information, it didn't really point Pat in any direction. And so he was about to turn and leave when the cop said, hey, you know, do you want to ride to the hospital? Because it seems like you could be having some sort of medical event here. But Pat politely declined and just told the officer to please be in touch with him if anybody came calling looking for somebody that kind of seemed like him. And the police officer said he would. And so after this, Pat left the station and went back to the shelter and basically told himself, I'm going to stay here and just wait until my memory comes back. Because at this point, that was kind of all he could do. However, weeks would go by at the shelter and nobody would contact the police looking for somebody like Pat Brown and Pat wouldn't remember any more details. The only thing that kept coming into his head was those three names, Pat, Joel, and Chris, but that was it. And so finally, after a few weeks of no progress being made, Pat decided he would leave the shelter in Cheyenne and go to Jackson, Wyoming, because some other people in the shelter had talked about Jackson, Wyoming as being a place where people who don't have ID cards could get jobs and basically start over. And because Jackson was only a little over 400 miles away from Cheyenne, it was not unreasonable to try to hitchhike your way to Jackson. And so almost exactly two months from the day Pat woke up inside of this ditch, he began hitchhiking his way towards Jackson. 
And then when Pat got to Jackson, he was able to get a job without an ID. He got a job at a newspaper, sorting mail and doing some clerical work. And at first he stayed in the shelter like he had in Cheyenne until he had saved up enough money to rent a room. And as the months went by in Jackson, Pat did begin to remember additional details about what seemed like his former life. He discovered while doing clerical work at the newspaper that he was able to use an adding machine without looking at it. It was like his fingers just knew where to go. He also discovered that he was able to do really complex math problems in his head. And then also in virtue of being at the newspaper, he saw a lot of information about the stock market and he actually seemed to know a lot about the stock market, even though he didn't know why. Also, while Pat was in Jackson, he started to feel this really intense compulsion to go to a Catholic church. And so he began going to Catholic mass. And while he was in church, he just automatically began saying the prayers along with everybody else. Even though, again, he didn't really know why he had that information in his head. But the biggest clue that came back to Pat while he was in Jackson was this recurring dream he would have where he was at this campground somewhere and this little boy comes around the corner and looks up at Pat and says, hey dad, mom needs your help with Chris. And then in the dream, he responds to this child by saying, okay, Joel, I'll be right there. And so with all these clues kind of coming back into focus, Pat sort of felt like he had a grip on who he used to be. Based on the callus on his finger and on that recurring dream, it did seem like he was a married man who had at least two kids, you know, Joel and Chris. And so his wife was very likely named Pat, or maybe Pat was another child he didn't know. And then also he felt like he must have been maybe an accountant or somebody who worked with numbers, you know, based on the adding machine and understanding the stock market and complex math problems. And also he was a devout Catholic because that's the only way he would know all those prayers. But despite kind of putting together who he seemed to be in his previous life, that didn't really tell him anything about what he should do now. Like he didn't know where his potential family was or where his job was or where he should go. And so even though he had this kind of former life formed in his mind, he couldn't act on it. And so Pat's weird life in limbo in Jackson, Wyoming, just kind of continued to drag on. And so by the end of 1997, so by this point, it's been three and a half years since Pat has woken up in the stitch confused. He's still in Jackson, Wyoming. He still has no idea who he is. And it's starting to set in that unless he takes drastic measures here, he'll never figure out the truth about who he is. And so early in 1998, Pat does take drastic measure. He contacts a very popular TV show at the time called Unsolved Mysteries and asks them to please cover his story because if they did, it would be broadcast across the country and maybe somebody out there would recognize him and come find him. And sure enough, when Pat contacted Unsolved Mysteries, they thought his story was totally insane and they covered it. Pat's episode aired on April 10th, 1998, almost exactly four years after Pat woke up in that ditch. And on the day his episode aired, in a city in Indiana, 1,500 miles away from Jackson, Wyoming, a phone rang in a woman's house. And so she answered it, and it was her cousin, and her cousin told her, stop whatever you're doing and turn on the TV, put it on channel CBS. And so this woman, she walks into the living room, she turns on the TV, flips it to CBS, and she sees an episode of Unsolved Mysteries is playing, and it's Pat Brown's episode. And this woman is staring at the TV and she practically faints when she sees what it's about. But she stays composed and just stands there staring at the TV, so shocked she can't even say anything. And the whole time her cousin is yelling through the phone, you know, saying, can you believe it? Oh my goodness. And then at some point on the TV, a phone number flashed at the bottom of the screen where the producers of the show told the audience, hey, if you know anything about this case, call this number. And so with this, the woman who's watching the TV, she hangs up on her cousin and she dials that number she sees on the TV. Pat's drastic decision to call Unsolved Mysteries would indeed solve the mystery of who he was. However, the truth about who Pat was is not what you think. It would turn out some of the clues that Pat had sort of naturally recalled in those four years that he was kind of figuring out who he was were indeed clues of his former life. He really was a married father. Those three names, Pat, Joel, and Chris, those were the names of his wife and his two sons. Pat was his wife and Joel and Chris were his two sons. And he really was a devout Catholic, which is why he was able to remember all of those prayers. But some of the other clues he thought of over those four years, like his incredible aptitude for math or the fact that he could use an adding machine without looking or the fact that he understood the stock market so easily, those were clues about his former life, but specifically, they were clues about why Pat was in this position in the first place. It would turn out Pat Brown was actually a man named Carl Brodnick Jr. 
And Carl Brodnick Jr. was a wanted felon who had misappropriated tens of thousands of dollars from the advertising agency where he worked as an accountant. And Carl had been under serious criminal investigation when he suddenly disappeared from his home in Indiana on July 8th, 1994, which is five days before Pat Brown woke up in that ditch on the side of the road with a lump on his head, markings on his wrist, and having no idea who he was or what happened to him. Now, there has never been a perfect explanation for what actually happened to Carl, but if you think about this logically, his claim of having amnesia is very likely true. Why would a guy use amnesia as his cover story to flee the law, you know, run to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and say, I don't know who I am, I don't know what happened to me, only to then, what, a few years later, go on national TV and out himself and totally make himself a target for the police? It doesn't make any sense. And then also adding credibility to this idea that maybe something happened to Carl versus Carl running off to save himself is we know that when Carl disappeared on July 8th, 1994 from his home in Indiana, he took out $1,000 in cash from his checking account and then also took out another large sum of cash from his home's second mortgage. However, when he woke up in that ditch, all the money was gone. He just had 23 cents in his pocket. Now, after Carl vanished from his house in Indiana, police did go looking for him because he was under criminal investigations. So they wanted to find him and they pretty quickly found his car 250 miles away from his home in a strip mall parking lot in Missouri, but there was no sign of Carl anywhere. And then right after the police found his car, they checked Carl's credit card and they discovered it had just been used in Colorado, so 900 miles away, to buy clothes. But when they went to that store and tried to find security footage of, you know, when that transaction took place, there was no footage. And so there was no way of knowing if Carl really was the guy in Colorado making that transaction or if somebody else had his credit card. And then after that, there were no other leads. Nobody had any idea what happened to Carl. His family didn't know. The police had nothing to go on. And so very quickly, his case went cold until four years later when that episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired. Now, there are many theories about what could have happened to Carl, but the leading theory that, again, is just a theory, is that Carl may have been in debt to some very dangerous people. And so when he fled his home in Indiana, it's very likely that he was not running from the law, even though he was under criminal investigation. He was actually running from these dangerous people. And that the reason he might have been stealing from his company was to pay off these dangerous people, but apparently it wasn't enough. Hence why he decided to just kind of take off and run away. And these dangerous people seemed to have caught up to him and they captured him. And it looked like they tied his wrists at some point because of the marks on his wrist. And they very likely tortured him or something hence why he had this very serious head injury. And then it seems like they dumped him on the side of the road, very likely to die. They might've thought he was dead already, but he didn't die. And when he came to, he must've really had amnesia from the injuries he sustained from these bad people that chased him down. But again, that's just a theory. When Carl's episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired, it was his wife, Pat Brodnick, who was the one who saw him on TV and couldn't believe it and called it in. And then when she called this in, at first, you know, Carl was reunited with his family and it was this big, happy reunion. Carl comes back home, he sees his wife and his kids, and then he's immediately arrested and prosecuted for embezzlement. Now, ultimately, Carl would plead guilty to the charges against him, but he would say the whole time, I don't remember committing this crime. I don't remember anything. And so ultimately, Carl did not get sent to prison. He instead served time on probation. And then after it was over, he just went back to living as Carl Brodnick Jr., despite still having huge gaps in his memory, at least according to Carl. So that's gonna do it. If you want more Strange, Dark, and Mysterious content, remember, we have a whole slew of Strange, Dark, and Mysterious podcasts that are free to listen to right now. All you have to do is go to any podcast platform and type in Ballin Studios, and you'll see there's the Mr. Ballin podcast, there's Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, there's Bedtime Stories, there's Run Fool, there's Wartime Stories, they're awesome. Go give them a listen if you're a fan of the Strange, Dark, and Mysterious. So that's gonna do it. Thank you guys so much. Until next time. See ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for a professional, strange, dark, and mysterious storyteller, I was in the military. And while I was in the military, I definitely had some pretty wild experiences all around the world. But to be honest, what I remember most about my time in service was not any of my own exploits, but rather it was the insane stories I heard from other service members. Keep in mind, military service members are sent to some of the most isolated, desolate, inhospitable places in the world. And many times in those places, 
weird things happen, unexplainable things, like borderline paranormal things happen in these places. Think being out in the middle of the ocean with absolutely nothing around and seeing lights popping up on the sky and coming out of the ocean and seeing figures up on the mountains wandering around where there shouldn't be any people. I mean, there are insane stories out there from service members, but many of them are not necessarily told in the public. They're kind of kept within the military. It's a like kind of part of military lore. That is the premise of wartime stories. And if that piques your interest, well, you're in luck because not only can you right now go check out the Wartime Stories YouTube channel, but also I personally hand selected wartime stories to come under the Ballin Studios umbrella and we have collaborated to make a brand new weekly podcast, the official Wartime Stories podcast, which is available right now. Go look up the Wartime Stories podcast on any podcast platform. It's free. All you have to do is look up Ballin Studios and you'll find Wartime Stories that way. Or you can direct search for Wartime Stories. Click on it, follow them, and give them a listen. It's an amazing weekly show with new episodes coming out every single Monday. Okay, back to the story. Before you go, I just wanted to point out that we sell merch, official Mr. Ballin merch, year round at shopmrballin.com. We do the limited drop model for holidays and special events and we'll create like special things that come out on those drops. But in between those drops, I just want you all to know that we always have the Ballin Basics line available at shopmrballin.com. And that includes things like t-shirts, crewnecks, hoodies, there's even a beanie and phone cases and more. So go check it out, shopmrballin.com. We have merch year round. And actually one design that just came out that's on sale right now, and it's I think one of my very favorite pieces of merch, is this shirt right here. It's a graphic t-shirt based on the Headless Valley, one of the best episodes I think that we put out on YouTube. The back is like a movie poster for the Headless Valley episode. And so this is a great shirt. I wear it all the time when I'm not wearing flannel, of course. And again, it's on sale right now at shopmrballin.com. All you have to do is use the code HEADLESS20 at checkout and you get 20% off this bad boy right here. But you gotta hurry because that code is only good until 11.59 p.m. on May 7th. After that, the discount's gone. The shirt's still there, but the discount is not. So again, merch year round with our Ball and Basics line at shopmrballin.com. And right now you can buy this Headless Valley Story Tee for 20% off by using the Headless 20 code at checkout. So go to shopmrballin.com and get your Mr. Ballin merch. So that's gonna do it. If you enjoyed today's story, be sure you check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds more stories right now that sound an awful lot like this one, but many of them are only on the podcast. They are not available on YouTube. So again, that podcast is just called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and you can listen to it on any podcast platform. Thank you so much. Until next time. See ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here. If you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious, then you've come to the right place.